Hi, and welcome to episode 25 of Understanding Dark Table. Uh, the Santa developers came through for us on the 24th of December with a brand new version of Darktable. It is 2.6 and there is a stack of new features and tweaks and modifications and in this episode we're going to run through and look at some of those things. Obviously a fair few of you will have already taken the plunge and dived on in and you've probably already made yourself familiar with some of these things but for anyone who hasn't we'll run through them. At the end of this video, we'll also talk about a few other bits and pieces that are going on. Okay, let's get started. Tip number one, there is no downgrade path. Okay, so if you feel like going to 2.6 might be a little bit risky, you have some reservations, please, please, please back up your config file because the format of the database has changed which means that once you upgrade to 2.6 you will not be able to downgrade back to 2.4.x okay 2.4.4 was the last stable version on ubuntu uh, i can't speak for other distributions but i'm assuming it was 2.4.4 for everything so if you are a little bit concerned please take a backup all right tip number two if you can't wait for me to get more videos out the door and i realize a few of you are chomping at the bit my apologies i'm working as quick as i can uh, definitely check out the blog i will put the link to the dark table blog not just the blog itself but the actual post that relates to the release of version 2.6 in the show notes down below uh, so it's a very long blog post because it covers pretty much everything I'm going to cover in this video. Uh, but if you need some more clarification, check out the blog post because it'll certainly get you up to speed quicker than I can get the videos done. Okay, tip number three. This is the first of a couple of GUI options tweaks. Go to preferences and under GUI options, if we scroll down about halfway, you will find enable extended thumb overlay. I highly recommend this tweak. What it does is here in the light table view, when you mouse over an image, you will get immediately under the image, the file name, the extension, the shutter speed, the aperture, the focal length, the ISO, and the star rating, which is pretty cool. And it just dynamically switches on and off for every image as you mouse over those images. So that's pretty cool. What you will find is that as you zoom the light table, that metadata gets bigger, but as you zoom out, it gets smaller and very quickly gets to the point where it's too small to read. But hey, it's still a handy feature to have and you can always use that control key and your mouse wheel to quickly zoom in and zoom out of the light table if you just quickly need to see the metadata for a given image. Tip number four, another GUI options tip right down the bottom you will find show scroll bars for center view and you have the option for light table light table in darkroom or no scroll bars at all i recommend going with both and what that does is when we are in the dark table view well also in the light table view if we zoom in we will now have this scroll bar here across the bottom of our image allows us to scroll left and right and assuming you've zoomed in beyond the height of the image you'll also have this vertical scroll bar as well now of course you could always do a very similar thing by using the letterbox that appears in this thumbnail up in the top left hand corner you can just click inside that letterbox and drag that around to do much the same thing but some people really like their scroll bars so now you've got them Okay, moving on to the tweaks that appear in the light table view. We'll call this tweak number one for the light table. The file extension, which has always appeared in this light gray text above the thumbnail, for portrait oriented images, that now appears vertically beside the image, which is really nice. So if you shoot in RAW plus JPEG and you easily want to identify which are your RAWs, which are your JPEGs, that extension, is now easier to see on portrait oriented images because it now appears vertically rather than being hidden behind the thumbnail of the image. Light table tip number two, local 
copy images, and I discussed this in an earlier episode, how to work with local copies. The icon for that has now changed. So if we go to selected images and go copy locally, now, instead of what used to be just a white dot that would appear beside the file extension, now appears as this little white triangular flag in the top right-hand corner of the thumbnail. Uh, it's just a tidier way of identifying your local copies. When you're finished with it, resync local copy and you're back to your original version. Light table tip number three, the sort column now includes aspect ratio, which means you can sort all of your portrait oriented images and then your square images and then your landscape oriented images by their aspect ratio. Light table tip number four, the sort column now also offers a custom sort and this allows you to drag and drop images to display them in any order you like. That's a nice new feature. Light table tip number five, right up here in the top right hand corner you'll see the letter G. What that will do is automatically collapse any images which have been added to a group. So if I take these portraits that we had done on the ship uh, and I click the G key, they now get collapsed down to a single image and we'll call it tip number six, they now appear with this G symbol in the top right hand corner of the thumbnail to let you know that that is a group of images. Uh, so you can simply click on it, hit the G key again, and your groups are expanded. Light table tip number seven, once you have sorted images or collapsed images that are in groups, you can then sort by groups. So we can click on the group option under sort by and now all of the images that appear in groups will be displayed at one end of the light table. I think by default they go to the tail end so you can just use the little up down arrow there to reverse the sort order if you want all of the groups at the beginning of the light table. Failing that of course you could just hit shift G to jump to the end of the light table. Light table tip number eight this new question mark icon that will enable a contextual help. So if there's something you want some help with, you can click on that and then click on whatever it is you want help with and hopefully Darktable will then take you off to show you the help. On my system it's saying there is no help available for this element. I've yet to find anything that it actually does find help for. I'm not sure if that's a configuration issue on my part or a failing of the tool. I'm sure someone can weigh in on that one. Light table tip number nine. Collections can now be sorted by aspect ratio, by shutter speed or by local copy. So if you just want to find images that you have created a local copy of, let's just randomly copy a couple and go local copy down the bottom and there's our two locally copied images. I can then select those and resync and now that collection is empty. We can also filter by aspect ratio. So if we go narrow down this search and Go by aspect ratio, and there are the aspect ratios of my images. Light table tip number 10. When you do filter in the collections module, you will see a number in brackets. That refers to the number of images which meet that particular criteria. So there are 58 images in this collection which have an aspect ratio of 0.7 to 1, which would be all of these images that are shot portrait. If I go 1.0, they are square because they have a one-to-one -one aspect ratio. There's my two square images. I have 11 images that are three-to-one aspect ratio. And there they are. And thirdly, we can go by exposure, which is shutter speed. So if I want to see all images shot at, say, a 15th of a second, there's that one and only. Light table tip number 11. This is a new tweak to the way you search tags. 
If we go to the tags in the collections module, and let's just say I double clicked on Port Macquarie. What Darktable will do now is return all images where Port Macquarie is the last text string in the tag. So if we were to pick one of these images and look at the tagging, we'll see that Port Macquarie is there as a standalone tag. So all of these images, or that image and all of these other images which have the same tag, they all get returned. However, there are two modifier variants of this behavior. One is to control and double click Port Macquarie. And what that will do is show images where there is a child tag below Port Macquarie. So if we look at any one of these images, we'll see Port Macquarie, Flynn's Beach, and all of these other tags will have some sort of child tag which follows on after Port Macquarie. The third modification is to hold down the shift key and double click Port Macquarie, and that will return all images where Port Macquarie is the last part of the text string and any images where Port Macquarie is any part of the text string. In other words, there are child tags below Port Macquarie. Light table tip number 12, a new tweak to the copying and pasting of history stack elements. If you have a source image and a destination image and they both share modules that have been activated, the modules that are copied from the source image will only overwrite the modules in the destination image if the modules share the same name. Now, by that, I mean that if you create more than one instance of a module, it gets a number one appended to the module name. So, just as an example, I've got this image here, which I've already processed, and I basically processed it to this stage here, but just for the purposes of this demonstration, I've created a second CBS module, which is contrast, brightness, saturation one, and I've desaturated it, right? And then on the very next image, I've got a contrast, brightness, and saturation that's doing its thing, and I've created a second module that's not actually doing anything at this point in time. So if we go back to the light table view, and we go to this image, and we click on copy, and we'll go select none, and just give us those two modules. And we click OK, and then we go to this image, and we click we make sure we're still on append, we don't want to overwrite, we just want to append to the existing history stack. Click on paste. Yes, we want those two modules. Click OK. And now the same values for both modules reflect what the values were in the source image. Light table tip number 13, probably not really light table specific, but there is now the option for, or allegedly for more involved CSS editing of the interface of Darktable. So if you prefer a light gray background or a white background and you know how to code some CSS, you can do all of that to change the visual appearance of Darktable. Now, I will confess this is a little beyond my level of either interest or expertise. Uh, but I did notice in that extensive blog post that I've mentioned a couple of times, there is the CSS for both a light grey interface and a white interface. So you can simply copy and paste the code from that blog post into the relative CSS file, which again the blog post will point you to. So if you want to change the interface of Darktable, you can. Light table tip number 14. For those of you coming across from Lightroom, welcome aboard. The importing of metadata.
from Lightroom is apparently now better than it was. So creator, title, description, and rights holder metadata will now copy across from Lightroom into the respective fields within Darktable. And lucky last for the Lighttable view, apparently importing collections from Capture One Pro is now more fully supported. It does require a little bit of tweaking of SQL databases and whatnot, but if you've got collections in Capture One Pro and you want to bring those collections across into Darktable, that can now be done. And again, I'll point you to the blog post for more information. Okay, by my tally, that's 19 tips so far. Tip number 20, the print module has been overhauled. It now includes more options for using Turbo Print. I will confess I have no idea what Turbo Print is. Uh, I saw something about other paper types as well. So if you're into printing your images from Darktable, uh, the print module might be worth a, a bit of a squiz as well. Tip number 21, the Find module has been either updated or has a new feature for find location. So if I look at this image here and I go to map and I can go to this find location module and I can type in Lifu and yes, it's found it in New Caledonia. Click on that, there's Lifu. And as you can see, I've already dragged that image onto the map there. Uh, it's a simple case of just dragging the thumbnails onto the map and dropping them where you want. Now, that will not place geolocation metadata in the image file itself. It will put it in the XMP sidecar file. But it does at least mean that you can tag where in the world you were when you shot particular images. If I was to type in Sydney, click on Sydney, New South Wales, Australia, we can see all these images that I've shot in the past that I've already dragged onto the map, and that will include that geolocation data in the XMP sidecar files for those images. And it's a simple case of just select a batch of images, drag and drop. It's that easy. Okay, moving on to the darkroom view. You can now single click to apply a preset from any given module to a new instance of that module. So if you've already used the module, but you want to create a new instance and select a preset for that module all in one go, you can do that. So if I was to look at, say, the contrast brightness and saturation, which is already active here, I can left click to bring up the preset menu but by using the middle mouse button I can create a new instance of the module as well as select that preset all in one go. So middle click and now I have a third instance of that module because I already had one that was inactive so I'll just get rid of that one. Uh, so now I have this second instance and it's using that mid-tone clarity to preset. All in one button click by using the middle mouse button. Darkroom tip number two, new modules can now be renamed. This is really nice. So if I was to go to say my good old trusty monochrome module here and let's say I select the blues and I want to rename this module. I click on the fourth icon there, the multiple instances action, and right at the bottom there, rename. And I might call that blue filter. Now, sadly, it retains the name of the module that Darktable gives the module and simply appends your chosen name onto the end of it which means if you're using something like the contrast, brightness and saturation module, which is quite a lengthy title, and you then give it a lengthy title, it's all gonna get mushed up here and you're not gonna see the full name of the module. I wish that you had the option to not include the native name of the module, but 
it's still an improvement. People have been wanting to be able to rename modules so that you can keep track of why you created a second instance of a module. So it is at least a step in the right direction. Darkroom tip number three. This is another one that long-term users have been screaming out for. We all understand that there is this concept of the pixel pipe within Darktable and that all of the modules act on our image in a given sequence and that sequence cannot be tweaked by the user. Certain things happen before other things, certain modules occur after other modules and they're just not adjustable. But what users have been screaming out for is the ability to change which modules appear in each of these tabs in the darkroom view. Well, you'll be happy to know that is now a reality. You can change the order in which the modules appear in these tabs. However, to do it requires a little bit of coding. So again, I'll point you to the blog post. Go and check that out if you want more information on how to reorder the modules within those tabs. Darkroom tip number four, there are two brand new modules, Filmic and Retouch. And I'm not going to go into these in great detail in this particular episode because both of them deserve an episode of their own. And although I had a list of other topics that I was going to do in the next few videos, Filmic and Retouch have kind of leapfrogged to the top of the pile. I want to make those the next two videos that I do. Uh, but I will confess I still need a bit more time, I need to read up a little bit more, really get my head around how they both work. I've been playing with Filmic and loving it, uh, Retouch I still need to learn a little bit about. Filmic is designed to emulate the way analogue film responded to the extremes of contrast. It is suggested that not to replace base curve and tone curve but to supplement those modules and it does a really nice job. The one thing I will say on a slightly negative context and it's not a, a, a problem with the module itself is simply that you need a minimum screen resolution of 1920 by 1080 for this module simply because if you look at my screen here this is full HD 1920 by 1080 and you cannot see the entire module unless you hide the film strip. That is the only way you are going to see the whole module in one screenshot because you, I don't think you can get rid of the histogram. So the only thing you can do is get rid of the film strip at the bottom. But having said that, Filmic is great and we'll get into that in one of the next two videos. Retouch is an absolute game changer in terms of its superiority over the spot removal module. The spot removal module, which has been in Darktable for a while, simply does copy and paste. It takes one little sample from a part of your image and pastes it over a problem area of your image. The new retouch module is much more intelligent. It does smart healing and cloning and it works in the wavelet domain. Now, if that means nothing to you, you really need to go back and check the previous episode, 24, on the equalizer module, because that uses wavelet algorithms as well. And the retouch module uses a very similar approach, whereby, I'll just very quickly show you this, we can view different levels of detail according to the number of wavelets that we introduce into the module. And like I said, I'm not going to try and cover this now because I still need to get my head around it more, but it is pretty incredible with the limited exposure I've had to it so far. So again, look for that in the next couple of videos. Darkroom tip number five, the color balance module has apparently had a massive overhaul. This is one of those modules that I've never used. Uh, I think I looked at it when I very first came to Darktable and just kind of went, whoa, that's really intense. Didn't understand it, didn't read the manual, and so never really got to understand it. I will at some point get around to reading up how it works and what it does, 
but apparently it's been extended quite extensively as well. And this is another module where if you're in either of these first two modes, which use a ProPhoto RGB color space, you absolutely will need at least a full HD display to see the entire module in one go. Uh, once you go to the standard you know, sRGB profile, then the module doesn't require so much real estate. But anyway, that's a topic for another video as well. Darkroom tip number six. There are new features in the masking section of the modules. If we have a look at this image here, which uh, I shot on Sydney Harbour, and I just did a little bit of a tone curve to try and lighten up the water. And you can see, if we zoom in, this is really weird artifacts all over the image. And that has to do with these new controls down here in the feathering guide. We've got a feathering radius, a mask blur, mask opacity, and mask contrast. If we look at our mask, we can see that it is quite splotchy and that's why we're getting that weird artifact happening all over it. We can create a little bit of a feather, we can introduce a little bit of a mask blur, and that softens it all off and actually gets rid of the majority of those artifacts. Again, this is something I need to read up a little bit more about, but just be aware that there are now these controls under mask refinement, which will appear in basically every module where you can use masks, which is pretty much every module in Darktable. We'll call this one Darkroom View 6B because this also pertains to masks. If you use drawn masks, you will notice that there is now a brush tool as well. So along with all of the previous shapes of circle, ellipse, and you know a drawn enclosed uh, loop, you can now use brush strokes to draw a mask. Darkroom tip number seven is the new duplicate manager module which appears on the left hand side in the darkroom view. Basically you don't need to go out to the light table now to create and delete duplicates. Now as I've said in the past Creating duplicates does not mean duplicating the actual image on disk. It simply creates a new XMP sidecar file to go along with one source image. It's like using a single neg to create multiple prints. So now I have duplicates of this one image where the current version that I'm looking at has the white thumbnail and we can see that I've got a pretty extreme tone curve on there. I can go to the other version of this image simply by double clicking on it and it does not have that silly tone curve on it. I just did that just to demonstrate how this works. If I decide that I don't want that dark version anymore, I can simply click on the X right here and that will allow me to send the selected image to trash. Now, again, don't be confused. It's not going to delete your image file off the hard disk. It's only going to get rid of the XMP sidecar file, which is represented by the current history stack. So you're not getting rid of your image. You're only getting rid of the XMP sidecar file. So we click on yes. And now we are back to having just the single version of the image without the silly tone curve module. If I want to create a new duplicate from this point, I have two options. I can click on the first icon here, create a duplicate of the image with the same history stack, or I can click this other one, create a virgin duplicate of the image without any development. So there's the history stack for the, the one we started with and click on our virgin copy and the history stack has just those four things. Darkroom view tip number eight. There is now finer control for profile denoise and raw denoise. 
I've read this briefly out of the blog post that I've mentioned a few times already, uh, but I have not yet had a chance to dive into those two modules and actually see how it works. But apparently it's something to do with when you're doing denoising using wavelets, uh, you have finer control over the type of curve that is applied so that you can have different strengths of curves for the different frequency layers in the wavelet domain. So if you're working on coarse detail, you can have a different curve to when you're working on finer details. So again, something I need to delve a little deeper into, but if, you, if that's something that interests you, read the blog post. Darkroom view, tip number nine. As I mentioned earlier, the spot removal tool it's a little bit hit and miss. It's very crude in its approach. It's simply a copy and paste from one part of the image to another part of the image. Now, this is an image I shot on Leafu, and as we can see, I've got a little bit of dust on my sensor here. So if we go into spot removal, pick a circle, click in there, and when I click out of it, there's a bit of a telltale sign there that it's a simple copy and paste job there is now the option to do a control and mouse wheel move to adjust the opacity of individual shapes and brush strokes when using the spot removal module. Previously, that would have affected all shapes and strokes within the one image to the same degree. So it would have adjusted the opacity of every shape you'd done spot removal with. Now it works on a per stroke or per shape basis. Darkroom tip number 10. The perspective correction module now features a ratio aware crop tool. In other words, if you are doing some vertical correction, as we might do here, because this wall looks like it's collapsing in on us. So we just give this a little bit of a tweak. We can now do an automatic crop using original format, and that will respect the existing ratio of the image prior to the perspective correction. So we click on that and it has now given us the largest crop possible which will exclude any black areas caused by the perspective correction. Pretty neat. Darkroom view tip number 11. The tone curve module now features a logarithmic view which means you can get much greater control over points right down here in the bottom left hand corner of the graph so close to zero and zero so if you need to really fine tune the dark shadows using the tone curve module by switching scale from linear to either log log which is logarithmic on both the x and y axis or log x or log y uh, you will have the ability to just get you know much finer control down here in the deep shadows. So we can do something like that. And you'll notice that when we switch back to linear mode, these two nodes will get much closer to the corner where they are much harder to work with. And lucky last, darkroom tip number 12. The zoom values on the thumbnail up here in the top left hand corner have now extended to include 50%, so half size, as well as 400, 800 and 1600% zoom. Now, for my 24 megapixel camera, 1600% is a waste of time because I just end up with this pixelated blur of absolutely useless information. But at least it's there. What you can't do is do it with the control and mouse wheel combination. You can still use that to zoom out and to zoom in as far as 200%, but if you want to go to 400, 800 or 1600%, you will have to select them from the pop-out menu. 
Okay, so I said it was going to be a, a very quick run through and it probably wasn't all that quick. There's so much to cover. The developers have given us so many tweaks and new tools in version 2.6. It is just, uh, it's like Christmas all over again. Uh, having said that, Christmas all over again? You've heard me in the, you know, six or seven months that I've been doing this video series on Darktable of just how long in the tooth my A850 is getting. You know, it's close to a 10 year old camera. Well, I just got myself a new A7 III. I love it. And I bought myself a Lauer 15 F2 manual focus wide angle lens, um, which I was a little bit dubious about to begin with because I thought, oh, do I really want to go back to manual focus? But the thing is, the camera offers focus peaking, which highlights little red dots all over the screen when areas are in focus. So it's very easy to dial in manual focus. Um, yeah, so anyway, I've also bought myself a Tamron 2875-28 and I'm still waiting, it's on its way, a new Sony 70 to 200 f4. I I thought about the 70 to 200 2.8, but it was like another two thousand dollars on top of what I'm paying for the f4 version. And I thought, yeah, I think I can survive with an f4 version of that lens. So I hope I don't live to regret that decision. Um, but um, yeah, it's really nice after all of these years. Like nine years I've been shooting with the A850 and I love the camera. It's been a great workhorse. It has done me well for all of that time. It is so nice, particularly as far as sensor technology has moved forward. Like the low light capabilities of this thing, unreal. You know, I, I haven't done an, an AB comparison, but I would say at, a, at an approximation, that the noise out of this at 25,600 ISO is around about on a par with the noise at 1600 ISO from my A850, which is now 10 years old. Like the low noise capabilities of these sensors has come that far in 10 years. It is just mind blowing. So yeah, absolutely loving that. Uh, on top of all of that, like I said, I will aim to make the next two videos about the filmic module and the retouch module. But like I said, I do need to spend a little bit more time getting my head around those two modules so that I can really do them justice when I create the videos for them. As for everyone who has sent in uh, various comments saying thank you for the video series, my pleasure. I'm glad that people are finding it useful and I'm doing my best not to waffle. I'm sure that there are times when I fail in that, but uh, I, I'm doing my best. And to those people who have asked me to do videos on specific things like the spot removal module, which was on my to-do list, I will probably merge that in with the retouch module and, and cover all of it in the one video because they're, they're kind of related. But like I said, the retouch module just blows the spot removal module out of the water in terms of what it does. I was thinking for a little while that it wouldn't surprise me if when 2.8 dropped at the end of the year that maybe the spot removal module would, would disappear. But then I thought about it more and I thought, no, they, they wouldn't do that because that would then break backward compatibility with images that you'd processed in the past that use that module. So I don't think the spot removal module will go away, but I honestly think that once people see retouch and learn how to use it, and it is a little bit complicated or it appears to be on first glance, I think once people get their head around it, it'll be your go-to for cleaning up noise and you know aberrations on your image. Uh, it looks pretty amazing. All right, that's gonna do it for this week. Great to be back. Um, I will do my best to get those two videos out in the next couple of weeks, but just bear with me if it takes a little bit longer. It's probably because I'm still sitting here scratching my head going, it does what now? <laughs>
Anyway, talk to you soon. Cheers.